on this episode of Tribe of Millionaires. Anna David, a six-time New York Times bestselling author and founder of Legacy Launchpad, a high-end publishing company helping people publish their books. Here's what you'll learn today. Why everyone with a business should write a book. People want to hire the authority on the topic. If you've got a landscaping business and you've got a best-selling book with at least 30 to 40 reviews on Amazon, you are going to get hired more than your competitor. The reality of writer's block. I don't believe in it. I think that writer's block. And the ideal book structure. You gotta check this out. The general idea is you start your story around chapter eight where it is like, here I am, I'm at the lowest of the low, or maybe if, if it's a different kind of story, I'm at the highest of the high. And then chapter two, you go back to childhood. Then you go to adolescence, then you go and the story builds, 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 and then around chapter nine. So tell me about the change. You mentioned the change to social and you've been able to witness this change in media. When you say that, just what are some things that come to mind when you say the change in media? Obviously, we've gone social, individual brands. You talk about thought leadership, but like, tell me what comes to your mind when you say I've witnessed this change in media over the last number of years. Well, when I, I got my first book deal in 2005 and I had agents coming to me being like, can you please write a book simply because I had a magazine column in a not terribly well-known magazine. We were sort of, magazine people were sort of the influencers of their day. Today, it's like try to name a magazine columnist, let alone a magazine that's still standing, let alone agents pursuing them to do books. It just, it doesn't exist anymore. And so back then it was, you know, it was a big deal to write for these magazines. Now it's, now you pay to write for Entrepreneur and Fast Company and Forbes. And I just simply social media, what it's done, how much influence people have completely randomly. Like it's completely random and oftentimes, you know, and I don't mean to sound so old, but I mean, I am like they're, they're young people who don't know jack shit about anything and they have all this influence. And I think it's equally dangerous for them as it is for the people listening to them. Yeah. hundred percent. Are, are you, where, where are you on social media mindset wise? Is it a tool? Is it an, is it, is it necessary? Is it annoying? I don't want to dance on TikTok. Like where is social media for you as you think about it today, maybe versus five, 10 years ago? I think I have a pretty good relationship with it because I'm not anti at all and I'm not obsessed at all. I'm really clear about where I'm comfortable and that is Instagram and LinkedIn and a, and a little bit YouTube. I, you know, I, it was kind of refreshing to go on TikTok and be like, I'm too old for this and I don't want to play. Um, I make videos, like I'll make 10 videos a month that my team posts on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, and LinkedIn, and I never go on to TikTok. And so, yeah, I mean, I think I used to be a little bit obsessive about Instagram, you know, and sort of try to time my posts and try to have the right hashtags and really look at the number of likes. And, and actually, I have gotten clients through Instagram and LinkedIn. I'm only doing it for that reason. I'm doing it to maintain my authority, to continue to build my authority about around building authority. And, and I also think it's kind of fun. Yeah. You self-published your first six, I'm sorry, you, you traditionally published your first six books. Yeah. Then you switched to self-publishing. Yeah. I want to dive into those first six books here, or at least a question about those in a moment, but let's talk about that pivot. Yeah. Obviously, you're in the self-publishing world. That's what you do. What was the differentiator? Why did you go from traditionally published books to self-publishing? Well, traditional publishing is hell on earth. I think in in the, the, the those are the three words that summarize it the best. Um, <laughs> it's it's really awful, and I it, I'm a very slow learner, and so I I had all the same delusions everyone has about it. So when I got my book deal in 2005 for my first book, I thought my life is made. I had a particularly um, kind of awful thing happen, which is Judith Regan acquired my book. In the 90s, if Judith Regan acquired your book, you were guaranteed New York Times bestseller. She published Howard Stern. She published Neil Strauss, like everybody. So my dream publisher acquires my book for a good amount of money. They are very excited about it. They're like, maybe we can get a reality show showing you and your year leading up to your book deal. We'll definitely have you on the cover. We're going to do a 60,000 print run. And then Judith Regan was fired by Rupert Murdoch in this, like the biggest scandal to ever hit publishing just a few months before my book came out. So 
authors talk about being orphaned when their editor goes to another publishing house. This was like orphaned and the orphanage was burned to the ground. <laughs> so I didn't understand the game was over for me. No one told me that there was no one there to tell me. So this book, which when my book sold, got so much buzz. I mean, it, there were articles everywhere and I was on the Today Show and doing all these things. But there was back then you had to sell a book to Barnes and Noble and, and Borders and all of these things, you meaning the publisher. There was no one to do that. So there was no distribution. And my book was actually released under on Amazon. The category was humorous science fiction. So it's like I've been accused of many things, but never being a science fiction writer. And so I didn't understand. There was no one there to tell me this book failed. There's no chance for it now. And so I just kind of and and they felt badly. So Party Girl was there was a huge bidding war for the film rights and all this stuff was happening, but there were no book sales. And my agent said to me, well, you know what we could try to do is have you change your name. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Change my name? She's like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of over for you under this name. And I didn't want to do that. And so Harper actually felt badly. Harper owned Regan books. And, and they literally gave me these like pity book deals every year. They gave me like $10,000, $15,000 book deals. And so I kept thinking, well, I'm getting more book deals with Harper. Like this isn't going so bad. And, and I just slowly like got broke. They never supported my books. And, and then it got to the point where I'm like, this is not working. My deals went from 50 grand to $2,000 and I, I can't actually survive. And so I thought I hated writing because they, it made me hate writing. And I realized, no, I just hated publishing. And the thing that it, I, I realized it's not their fault. They're a business just like anything else. And today they only want to give book deals to social media people because they want their books to sell. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with wanting their books to sell. So yeah. So even though one of my books was a New York Times bestseller, I still didn't make money really off of it. Not enough to live on. And all it gave me was a lot of people coming to me to ask me to ghostwrite their books, which is actually how I started my company. Self-publishing though, to me, feels a bit wild west. In other words, like it's like social media, like you said, like people don't know the influence they wield. It's just too easy. It's too accessible, if you will. Whereas the traditional publishing route, what did I hear the stat you say? It was something like two out of, two out of every 10,000? That's a stat I've heard. Right? It depends on, like there are small publishers. I, though, that's talking about the big five. Sure, you know. sure. That's big five publishers, right. But the point is, it's hard to break in on traditional. I get that. But I guess if you do, you should be able to at least make a livable wage from it. But self-publishing feels like anyone can do it. So how does somebody self-publish? I guess, uh, well, here's the first question. What should be the goal of somebody who self-publishes? Because here's what I've heard about writing a book. Don't write a book until they beg you for it. I don't know if that's good advice or bad advice, but what should be the goal of somebody Terrible who self-publishes? Terrible advice. Tell me why. Tell me why. First of all, I will say, I don't think of what my company does as self-publishing. We call it custom publishing or independent publishing because self-publishing is like, you know, write anything, throw it up on Amazon. Sure, sure. Good point. Yeah. Um, but 100% disagree with whoever said, wait till they beg for it because you do the book so that they beg for you. Hmm. Um, I am somebody who spent a lot of time sort of trying to prove myself to the gatekeepers, to the publishers. And when I was doing on our TV to like the people that would hire me and, you know, when I was actually trying to work for people, <laughs> to the people who might hire me. And I don't think people who can't do what we can do should be the ones deciding our fate. I think if you feel you've got something to share, if you're an authority in your topic, you owe it to the world to do a book. And it's only going to make more people want to book you, hire you, and do all of the things. I always say I'd rather have 100 people read my book and have their lives changed and possibly hire my company than 10,000 people who wouldn't care. People think it's about the number of books you sell and it's just not because hmm. you can't control that the the book business is the least democratic business that exists because there's either crazy hits crazy like chris voss or no i mean that's it and my theory about it is you know a, most people are not readers and so the the way a book gets big whether it's 50 shades of gray or something by glennon doyle or chris voss is people non-readers read it so they start going to parties and going places and someone's like you've read 50 shades of gray right and they start to feel stupid for not having read it so once it spreads to the non-readers you've got a crazy hit but that is so 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 rare mm. chris is you know 
Yeah, I do know. I do know. I mean, I know someone who had a number one New York Times bestselling book. Book was made into a hit movie on every TV show you can think of. Literally can't string two pennies together today. It doesn't mean anything except that year. When you publish a book, should you be looking at it like you're creating a business? You shouldn't look at it as creating a business. You need to, I think you need to have a business that your book then you know, blows up to the next level. What is that? Okay. So give me an example of maybe there's some that you've worked with. Like, what do you mean by a business? So if I'm a, if I own a landscaping company or is it more info product type company, I have courses or whatever, but like, give me an example of what you mean by that. They have a business that you want to blow up to the next level with a book. So it means either because people want to hire the authority on the topic. If you've got a landscaping business and you've got a, you know, a best selling book, with at least, you know, 30 to 40 reviews on Amazon, you are going to get hired more than your competitor, a lot more. It also gives you an opportunity to sort of explain what you do, share your knowledge. I think business books should be written in a way, um, like my most recent book on good authority, I wrote it so that somebody could read it and do exactly what it is my company does. And someone else could read it and say, I don't want to do all that work. Let me hire that company. Mm. Um, so it should absolutely be of service. So you're sharing all the, you know, the 20 years you put into your career, you're sharing it with people, but you should be using it to showcase your authority so that people want to work with you. And maybe that means getting on more stages, or maybe that get, means getting on more podcasts, but you know, we're doing a book with us is very expensive. So I think if you're selling a hundred dollar course or even a thousand dollar course, it's not a good idea to, to do a book with us. Yeah. But if What's you've the, got a business where a client's worth $20,000, it's a great idea. What's the advantage of when you say doing, you mentioned like you're not a self-publisher, particularly self-publishing is like throw a book out there. But what's the advantage of doing a book with you versus just finding a way to kind of get the book to market and, and hopefully pump it up on Amazon? Yeah. I mean, we, my team is like, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling authors. Like they write for the New York Times. I'm a total snob, we, you know work with just like a fraction of the people that reach out to us. But, and, and we were the only one that comes from traditional publishing. So we are able, I was able to know, and now I've been able to teach my team how to publish a book in a way that makes it indistinguishable from a traditionally published like New York Times bestseller. So it's a very extensive process with hundreds of moving parts that you, you can't get that experience I mean, the truth of the matter is we give our clients everything I wanted and didn't get, which was support from the publisher, which was to be told the truth, which was to feel taken care of, which was also to have some say in it. In traditional publishing, you get your cover, you get your title, and you like better like it because you've given up control. So we very strongly advise our clients based on everything we've learned, but you know they get to have say in what they want. Interesting. The person who maybe doesn't have a business, but has a book in them with the desire to maybe speak and solicit, mm -hmm. you know, really big speaker fees is, is a book the right first move in that regard? Absolutely. I mean, and we've had people who have done that. My first client, Darren Prince was, Oh, I know Darren. Do you know Darren? I do well. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've, I've read his book. I've had him on the show. I've done a bunch of, I've, I will coach people in exchange for donations to Aiming High. Oh my God. Well, you know that, did you know we published it? I, you know what? I did. Now that you say it, I did. I looked at it when we were going to start in October. I remember doing yeah. a lot of research back then and like, oh, look, Darren Prince popped up. And then honestly, I completely forgot till you just mentioned it, but I do remember seeing Aiming High in his new book, I, I think as well, you worked on. Yeah. No, we didn't. And that's why it doesn't look as good. He, I mean, I think anyway, he <laughs> came to me because um, I was, I was, because I was very open about my sprite, I'm sober over 23 years. And, you know, I did three TEDx talks on it and yeah. many books and all these things. So lots of people came to me and said, hey, would you write my addiction recovery memoir? I always said, no, Darren was the most insistent, so insistent that I said, I'll hire someone else to write it, but I'll edit it. And then we we had the manuscript and, it, and he said, I need you to publish it. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And he's like, well, I'll pay you to learn. And so that book comes out and he's, you know, on every TV show, every on every podcast, suddenly getting all this money to speak, spokesperson deals. And then the clients have just come steadily from then. We've never done any marketing or advertising. It's all pretty much referral. That book... As you mentioned it, if we don't mind, I want to deep dive this a little bit. Talk about the dynamics of that book. So I remember reading it and it was, it was sort of mix of 
incredible story, sad and then inspiring, but also it overlaid this pop culture phenomenon that he was involved in. Kind of like you, right? Like here's a guy that's well known, but he's like the guy with all the guys like Hulk Hogan yeah. and Magic Johnson and everything. Is that the, for a memoir to work, is that book the, is like, is that a blueprint where it's got a, Hey, like some level of entertainment along with some level of inspiration. I'm just curious. Like when you, you said you had somebody write it and then you edited it. And yeah. I, to me, that book took off. That's book was gold. I, I've, yeah. I've given away hundreds of them. Oh my God. No, That's no bullshit. I literally I had a hundred of them at an event. He flew into Michigan to speak. I raised $10,000 for aiming high. He flew into Michigan oh to speak when God. I lived there and we gave away a hundred of his books or whatever. Uh, maybe it was more than that, but anyway, great book. Can you give me a sense of, is that, is that a quality memoir? This is an aside. We'll come back, but I just, I'm just curious about that. Is that what a memoir should incorporate? Is it, is it the, yeah. the lessons and the entertainment? Absolutely. And you don't have to have, you know, a pop culture part of your story, <laughs> but it sure is going to make it, you know, more compelling to people. We like reading about the bold face names. Mostly what it, it, it follows a, a, a structure. It's the same structure that I used for my not New York Times bestselling book that I wrote for the t actor Tom Sizemore. Start in the middle of your story. So we, it was sort of like a 10 chapter format where, but I think that one was 12. But yeah, the general idea is you start your story around chapter eight, where it is like, here I am, I'm at the lowest of the low, or maybe if, if it's a different kind of story, I'm at the highest of the high. And then chapter two, you go back to childhood. Then you go to adolescence. Then you go and the story builds, builds, builds. And then around chapter nine, you catch up to whatever that, that preface was. And then you go into the recovery and the inspiration. But yeah, we've done a number of books like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great book. I, I forgot all about Darren uh, as, as a client of yours. So I'll have to text him after this. Yes. We, back to the business of books. I think I heard you talk about being an author is not a career, which is what we were essentially talking about. Like it's it's a uh, JK Rowling, you know, Stephen King. It's a, it's a unicorn at this point, right? Just being yeah. an author and writing books and being paid for them is not a career. So for you though, if I remember right, what was it like? You were six years old and you saw that a four-year-old was the youngest author and it made you cry. Is that, is that an accurate story? That's an accurate story. Dorothy Strait. Was, was her name. <laughs> Why did it make you cry? Because I wanted to be the youngest author. <laughs> um, and I was obsessed with world records because Bobby and Cindy set the world teeter-totter record on Brady Bunch and I was obsessed with Brady Bunch. And so I, I, when friends came over, I was like, they're like, what do you want to do to play? I'm like, set a world record. Mm -hmm. And so my friend Ramsey and I did try to set the, the world swing set, right, longest time of swing set, didn't work out. But I was always really ambitious and really clear that I wanted to be a writer. And so I was actually submitting stories to Highlights Magazine and trying to get published as a kid. So yeah, so yeah, Dorothy Strait was sort of devastating. So to be an author though is, is a very difficult career. You've got the business of publishing. Does, does that make you, I don't know, sad at all? Like, do you wish you could be an author or do you love the publishing side? Have you found love in the publishing side or is author still the dream? Oh, n no. Author is not the dream at all. In fact, I actually feel bad for people who are full-time writers because that Why? seems really boring. How you know, so? How I, so? I was very depressed the years that my, my only job was as a writer. I lived in New York from 2007 to 2010. And, you know, my days consisted of, you know, writing three pages a day. And, and the way I worked when I was working on books is I revise the three pages I wrote the day before, and then I write my three pages. And it's just kind of, I don't know, I want way more variety. I want my days to have, you know, I'm, I'm working on this one thing. Maybe I'm writing a little bit. I'm, you know, we're doing a podcast. I'm, I, I really need that variety. And did a, when I was doing on-air TV stuff, I was on the show called Attack of the Show. And when the hosts were gone out of town, I would fill in for the host, the Olivia Munn, who became kind of a big actress. And I would be on set all day kind of like, I wouldn't want to do this all day long. I'm just not that kind of person who wants to do one thing all day. Is it a romantic notion then, this idea that oh, I could just get my Starbucks and write and I have this amazing life as an author? Is that is that That's just not realistic, it sounds like. I'm sure it is for some people, but it's not for me. <laughs> you ever experienced writer's block? No, I don't what? believe in it. What do you mean you don't believe in it? I think that writer's block is sort of perfectionism masking fear because... 
because if you're a writer, you know, I always sort of liken it to the, to the bricklayer doesn't wake up and, and put down a brick and go, you know, I just don't feel inspired to put down the next brick. I don't know. It, it's, just, it's not part of the deal. Like you can't call yourself a professional and just one day feel like you can't do it. Some days are going to be more creative and more effective than others, but just write what Brene Brown calls the shitty first draft and just keep going. Yeah, that makes sense. How many days does it take you to write a book at that pace? You said three three pages. So do you take you about three months to write a book? Is that a reasonable time frame for somebody to think about writing a book if they're doing it full time or just generally? Yeah, I mean, I've known people who I've known people who've written great books in a weekend. I don't know. I didn't read them when I first launched. When I first my first year as a published author, I was in some this group called the Debutante Ball for women who were releasing their first book, and there was a woman in there. He wrote a book in a weekend. Obviously there are people, you know, Robert Green takes, you know, 10 years. Uh, yeah, I think whatever, whatever's realistic for the person, Taylor Swift can write hundreds of hit songs, whereas other musicians can not write any. So I think it just really depends. You're a, you're a Swifty, I, I take it. Oh, You've mentioned her twice God. now. Next level, yeah. <laughs> What is she, I'm sure you're on the, on the, on the thought leadership or authorities side of things. Is there anything that you see from her that's like that you want to emulate or is actionable for most people that they don't get that she is doing? I mean, she's a, I get where she is, but just on a, on a tactical level, your space is thought leadership. How is she, how has she become such a great thought leader? What are some, anything you've observed? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Cause I could talk about this forever. <laughs> I think one of one of the things, the reason for her initial success is, you know, you need to know your who, your what, and your why. And the more niche, the better when you're starting. So it's like her who, people who want country music from teenage girls, that's a pretty small who. Her what was really clear. She writes heartfelt songs about love. And, you know, her why, and she has these as lyrics in some of her songs. Like she, you know, there's a, there's a line she had, she has about like, I've spent my whole life trying to make sense of it, this, meaning love and relationships. So she was really clear, you know, anything, if you've watched documentaries about her, read articles, she knew what she wanted. She wanted it so badly. And I think the reason we're all so obsessed with her is not just her ridiculous talent as a songwriter, but she sort of symbolizes someone who lands on top. You know, she's had these very public struggles. Kanye West took her VMA from her, stole that moment when she was 17 years old. And then um, Scott Borchetta, her original, who owned the first label she was at, sold her music to Scooter Braun, who was her arch enemy. And then Kim Kardashian released this like doctored video of her, you know, and she just was kind of getting slammed, slammed, slammed. She comes back and she has a lot of lyrics about karma. She comes back. You look at the people who wronged her today. Look where Kanye is. Look where Scooter Braun has had like a major fall from grace. And she just rises and rises and rises. And she she's so unpetty. People think she's petty because of this song she wrote about Katy Perry, allegedly. But but she's just she's so admirable and she seems so kind. You know, when on her album 1989, she invited fans into her homes to listen to the music and made them chocolate chip cookies. You know, she's everything I aspire to be. Where are you short of her? Not following. Oh, her, but like what, I mean, when you many, aspire to be her, what, what, what elements are you not executing on or are you not um, aligned with? I don't think I'm as kind as she is. I don't think I'm as emotionally mature as she is. I also, because I'm obsessed with her, know, you know, a lot about how she was raised. She had, has spectacular parents. They just seem amazing. And I do think that's, you know, obviously you can have spectacular parents and not be successful, but I think that that, you know, she was set up for, to have, to be a very kind, well-adjusted person. Is kindness her superpower or is it authenticity? I think both, but I think kindness is pretty, pretty key. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. So you, you being you, even if it's not as like bubbly and kind, you don't think that's the, that's, that's not a formula for success. And I have a, a follow-up question on that, but I'm just curious your thoughts on it. You know, I think kindness is more important than people realize. I just finished reading The Go-Giver. Have you ever yeah. read that? Yeah. Long time. I know. I, I was late on that one. And, and also Joe Polish is my mentor, yeah. you know, what's in it for them. I didn't know until I met Joe, which was almost 10 years ago, 
and saw how he gives. I mean, I can, I can tell stories about him that are crazy what he's given to me. And to see what he does, and it's not to get anything, it's simply because he's got the biggest heart and he's pretty much the most successful person I know. Sure. So I have lots of evidence of why being kind and giving, how that's related to success. The giving thing is always a, I always get slapped in the face being reminded of that. And maybe you've had this experience as well, but whenever I'm in scarcity mode, I tend to, I tend to sort of grip onto what am I going to get? How can I, how can I get myself out of this? Which usually means some level of acquisition, more money, more attention, more something like I I want something. And when I get like, when I feel like it's not coming, I I grab onto like tactically, how do I get it? And when I release that and finally say like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to like, you know, I'm going to add value. Like I can even see it. Like this person wants time on the phone with me. Like, what do they think? I'm too busy. Like when I get into that mode, you know what I mean? Things just don't go well. And I just sort of compound on this like scarcity piece of me. So when I finally say like, oh my God, like this is a human being who has a need or whatever. Not that I could just jump on the call with everybody, nor can you or whatever. But you know, when you come at it from a place of compassion and how can I help and how can I give and whatever. Things just open up, man. Scarcity uh, goes away and abundance kind of comes into my life. I'm assuming that's the same for you. I mean, I'm completely, and you just talked about it so articulately. And I, I think about that a lot because, you know, one of my favorite books, when I say favorite, it's not an enjoyable read, but it sure is meaningful. Letting Go by David Hawkins. He's got this line, we get what we want when we stop insisting on it. So true. Such a beautiful line because- When you're gripping, it's coming from a place of fear and the universe feels our energy. And they say the universe can't tell the difference between a fear and a wish. So you are putting out there, don't give this to me, literally. And and it's interesting because, you know, it's actually my pet peeve when people kind of have an expectation that you'll jump on the phone with them or jump on Zoom. I happen to really not like doing that. I have a friend, my friend Justin Breeden spends all day long, he says, on Zooms with people. I do not like doing that. Yeah. And and so most of the time I just don't respond. But that's also because like I already spend so much time doing this. Yeah. But but it's interesting because you know I'm in 12 step where there's a big emphasis on service. For the that exact same for the reason that it frees us. So 2 weeks ago I go to Target and there's a guy that's like, "Hey, are you registered to vote?" and I just ignore him. And then he yells after me and I decide he's super rude. And then when I'm leaving Target, I see someone, the guy in front of me, stop and talk to him. And it's like, I kind of was like, oh, I kind of forgot that was an option. I go to Target on Friday, same dude. He's like, are you registered to vote? And I go, yeah, I am. He's like, can you, can you, and I spent 20 minutes signing his petitions and I left feeling so good. Yeah. And I'm just like, why don't I do that all the time? Oh, you can't. And it's funny. You mentioned about the Zoom thing. Justin, I just had him on. It's funny. The, the names, the, the connections. He oh, you just had top. Justin? I did. Uh, yeah. Am- amazing interview. He, everything is, everything it was. Um, Colby. Yes. Yeah, everything. I was, a, I was a series of numbers and letters by the end of the call. I, I'm like a binary code now. But yeah. um, the point I made with like Zoom or phone call is there was a period of time for me. And I, we haven't talked about my story, but I was a, an executive with a big insurance company for many, many years. And at 42, three years ago, after some prep, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to let this go. Equity level position, making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I'm going to leave. And I left wife and kids at home. She doesn't work and said, I'm going to forge this new career. Some of that being as a podcaster. And thankfully, God, knock on whatever, it's been it's been great. It's been fun. I live in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic now. We moved down here a year ago, year and a half ago. So it's been an amazing journey. And, you know, who knows who knows if and when it ends. But there was a point in time on that journey where the person who wanted to get on a call with me or get on a Zoom with me meant everything. And so for me now, and that wasn't your thing. Like for you, it's read my book, right? Like it would be almost like you at some point saying, ugh. This person wants me to wants to me to send it, or they want to hear about my book, or they want me to they want to read my book, like you, or you be, they want me to read their book. Well, no, right, but I mean, my point is like you wanted people yeah. to read your book, yeah, and now somebody reaches out now that you've had success and says, "Hey, I loved your book," and you're like, "Ugh, leave me alone, peasant." Like that's how I'm treating that because I wanted the zooms, I wanted the one on one calls, and now that right. I can't don't have time for them, I go and scare them. Like, ugh, leave me alone, peasant, and I feel. The universe saying, hey, asshole, like that was everything to you three years ago. And now you're acting like you're too big for it. Let me show you what that looks like 
in your life. Let me show you what that feels like. But I will say it has everything to do with the approach. Oh, true, true. You yeah. know, if somebody, I'm, I am such a sucker for flattery. It just happened last week. This, this woman wrote, I guess I didn't see the email. And then she wrote my assistant who forwarded it to me. And my assistant just goes, oh yeah, yeah. Do you want me to just tell her no nicely? And I look at her email and it's so kind. And just like you today, she knew all this stuff about me. And I just wrote her directly out because she wanted me to blurb her book. I'm like, I'll blurb your book and maybe I'll recommend it on my, on my KATU segment. But I have people all the time who literally write and say, hey, I have a book. I think it would be good for you, your name, if you blurbed it and just stuff like that. So yeah. it really has to do with the approach. I agree. You know what I hate most? And, and I've done this, so I hate it that I've done it. And I hate when people do it is, hey, how can I add value to you? I've always hated that question because it puts so much burden on the, like if I say that to you, and how can I add value to you? You're like, I don't, I don't, I, or, let me ask it. And how can I add value to you? I don't know. Cause I could tell you. You can tell me how I can add value to you. Oh, you could connect me with people, you know, who, who don't have books and want to do them and have amazing stories. And you know what? You could do that. Right. You right. Know right. Them. Exactly. But see, but I think you know that a little bit about me. Right. That I could, right. so it helps. But like when somebody says that for me, it's like, I know nothing about you. So like, I, I mean, I have to now come up with, for me, right. like, wh what do you do? What are your skills? What are you, whatever? So I do the same thing. When I say it to somebody else, I am always cringing. Like now I'm making them think about like, all right, um, I, my shoulder's sore. Can you give me a back rub? I, right. you know, like whatever. Right. So I've always hated that. That's to me a bad approach, even though it's with great intention, it's a bad approach. Whereas like what you did, you're listening, we're having a conversation. We've connected yeah. some dots, Justin Breen, Darren Prince. We talked about some people that we've had on the podcast before we started recording. Yeah. So you, you're listening. So yeah. if, if you know, if that question comes out, you know, the value or perceived at least the value I might be able to provide to you and vice versa, right? Like I know right. something about you. So I could say, oh, Anna, she's looking to publish books, this, that, and the other. I know who I can. Hey, Anna, would you like an introduction to so-and-so? I think they, they would be right. the perfect client for you. I think that's a better way of going about it. Like learn about that person, what yes. their needs are, and then put your value offering specifically into whatever the category of need that they have is that you've learned about. Does that make sense? It totally does. And I think it's probably people trying to follow the sort of go giver or Joe Polish, you know, recommendations without full clarity on how it works. He's a genius with this stuff though, right? Like he's genius level. So you're right. I think it's like, he has to dumb it down to that question. Like, figure out how to add value to people because he's like, I've never seen a guy. Uh, well, honestly, I've never seen you maybe one, but Darren might be another, but like you're in that category of like, holy cow, the connections that you've made, holy cow, the ability for you to come on. You don't believe that about yourself? Depends. Not really. I mean, not like Darren or Joe. I think you're selling yourself short, but go ahead. I mean, I don't know. I will tell you my favorite Joe Polish story is I made him. My sister-in-law connected us because I saw him and said, I want to know that person. Yeah. My sister-in-law knew him, connected us. He calls me. He's like, hey, I'm coming to LA. Um, I'm making a documentary about addiction. Do you want to be in it? And I'm like, yeah. So I go, I go, do you want to be on my podcast? This is when I had a recovery podcast. He has me, he interviews me for his documentary. I interview him for his whatever podcast, whatever we do interviews. We're leaving his hotel room and he's, he looks at his phone and there's a text from Tony Robbins. And I'm like, who is this guy? I don't really think I know. And then he says, do you want to come to breakfast? I'm going with my friend, Evan Pagan. I didn't know who that was. And so we sit down and I had just uh, prepared my first webinar. This is back when I thought all that would work as a business. Ugh. And I was like obsessed with everything Amy Porterfield. So I tell these guys, not knowing that they're experts in this, oh, I have my first webinar tomorrow and I'm so nervous. And I, but I have a hundred people signed up. Can you believe it? And Evan Pagan looks at me and goes, oh, you'll, you'll never sell anything. And I'm like, what? I, and he goes, 50 will show up and 25 will leave. And I'm like, what should I do? And he goes, well, instead of selling something at the end, ask them to set up a call so you can sell to them. And I was like, oh my God, I better go home and change my slides. By the time I get home, I have a voicemail and it's, um, hey, Anna, this is Amy Porterfield. My friend Joe said you're nervous about your webinar. Do you want me to look at your slides? So I send my slides over. I mean, that was Amy Porterfield. One. That was day one. Then yeah. Joe texts me and says, do you want to come to dinner with a bunch of people? And so I go and he's sitting with Dave Asprey and I'm like, and then 10 more people sit down. 
And then at the end of dinner, someone who I haven't even spoken to at the end of the table picks up the tab for everyone. And I just am like, who are these people? And, you know, he and I have been, you know, close friends ever since. Does he do that with everybody he meets? Some version. Some version. Why, yeah. why do you think he went as deep with you on all of this stuff? I think he... I, w I will say I was well known as a recovery person, as an addiction. It's same reason Darren, you know, was interested in working with me. So I think he saw that and he was, he's very passionate about addiction recovery. So he knew that working with me would, you know, would be good. But, but I think, I don't know, he saw I was like an authentic person and that I was really eager to, to, to learn about entrepreneurship. So um, you're proving my point. I put you in the category with the Darren's the Joe polishes on your ability to connect. It's not overt, right? It's not like you're, you're doing something tactically, but you right. put out into the world, a very vulnerable and real version of yourself, something that you struggled with became yeah. known at least to some extent in that space. And then yeah. you just said it, you're authentic, you're real. And I think people like a Joe can recognize yeah. that. Sure. I mean, I know he's your force multiplier in some ways, but I don't know. And when you go through and people that are listening, like when, if you just Google, if you've never heard of Anna David and you know, I don't know if you have or haven't, Google what just now what you just went through. Amy Porterfield, Tony Rob. I know what he was on the phone call, but whatever. Tony Robbins, uh, Joe Polish, Evan Pagan, Darren Prince, all these people that you're in this world with. That's not by mistake. That's not you're not Forrest Gump. You're not you're not truly Forrest Gump, you know? I feel I feel super lucky, honestly, the people that I have truly been lucky enough to connect with. I mean, probably Joe more than anybody, but sure. yeah. Yeah, everybody has their person. I'm curious on the on the the people that you've worked with, the authors, or even that you've observed. You talked about uh, Taylor Swift, kindness. We talked a little bit about authenticity, some different uh, aspects or attributes of people with a thought leadership platform or who have who have a platform. Who are some folks that or, or are there examples of folks that really get it right or got it right in the author space? And can you dissect that a little bit? Does somebody jump to mind? Like this author got it. Maybe you worked with them. Maybe you observed them. I, I, whatever you want to do there, but that really got it. The 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 whole thought leadership aspect and leveraging their skills and gifts. Go for it. I mean, no one more than Darren, probably. I my clients are the ones who have taught me about that. Um, a number of my clients. My second client was Emily Lynn Paulson. She did the same thing. She's in the New York Times. She's on the Today Show. She's doing TEDx talks. You know, within a year of her book coming out. My client Dan Nicholson. I don't know if you know him, but no. he's he just took it and ran with it. But a lot of them out and out that I haven't worked with. I think Chris Voss did an amazing job. That book put him on the map. Can you dissect it a bit? What did he do specifically? What do you observe in his, in his ascension that he did so well in making that book? Cause that book is huge. That book is huge. Part of it honestly is lightning striking. Sure. I mean, of course. Glennon Doyle is no better a writer than millions of writers out there with Chris. He has such an interesting story. He got a great co-writer, tall Roz. He, think about Chris, he's got an amazing personality. There's no one more charming, which is why he was such a good hostage negotiator. And guys think he's cool. Guys think Chris is a badass and girls like him too. So I think, um, you know, cause I, I got to know him through genius network and it's like, you could just see him coming in and they're all like, ah, oh, I wish I had a gun and was negotiating with criminals, you know, like it's cool. And he, again, such a nice guy. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, he tells me, cause I had him on my book publishing podcast, you know, that it was getting on Lewis house's podcast, just make, made everything blow up from there. Is that, is, are you just going to that medium today? Are podcasts still the best force multiplier for attention? Or is there something else that you're seeing bubble up in the publishing industry? I think podcasts are the best, you know, I'm not a believer in, you should go on every single one that asks you. There are people uh, that say that. I think Ben Hardy says that, yeah. you know, it's like, well, I don't know if 10 people are listening. Is that worth your time? I don't know. I personally only do ones that I'm excited about because I'm not going to bring anything good if I'm not excited about it. And just to talk on a mic is not, I I'm jaded. 
you know, and I think it was 10 years of doing, you know, Today Show and all that stuff. I'm just like, no, it's not a big thrill. I know it. I know it. Like my assistant who just published an amazing book loves going on podcasts because it's newer to her. But I think, yeah, certain podcasts can can help you blow up. Certain radio shows, Fresh Air, can still help you blow up. But but yeah, I think it's the thing. What is it that gets somebody on a podcast, especially like Chris Voss? He was, an, I mean, I, I don't know any of his story prior to the book. It seems like he wrote a book. He marketed it well and poof, he exploded. Before that, he was a hostage negotiator, right? What is it? How do you get on the podcast? How do you, I mean, I, I don't know if you work with your clients to get them on some of these larger Lewis Howes or, or uh, Lex Friedman type podcasts, but like how, what attracts somebody, a podcast host or a podcast pr- company to bring an author on in the first place? Well, it is. I mean, the the problem with that is it's not so different from the fact that big publishers support their authors who don't need the support. To get on those podcasts, for the most part, you have to be someone that they know about. You know, you can't, I know Lewis, he's never asked me to go on his podcast. <clears throat> you know, getting on a show like that is is really, really hard. So I, obviously, you know, they all have exceptions. I think I think Lewis Howes probably thought Chris Voss was a badass, so he had him on his podcast. We help our, we do help our clients get on podcasts, but also if they've never been on a podcast before, sure. we got to be realistic. So we're looking for more niche in their genre podcasts that, you know, we don't want to set them up to try to get on Tim Ferriss's podcast because that's probably just not going to happen. Interesting. Interesting. For you with the production company, well, first off, are you writing anything right now personally? Well, no. I mean, I'm writing for magazines, which is fun because it hadn't happened in a long, long time. At the same time, right when my son was born, because he's our good luck charm, because we had a son in July. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, um, I remember reading about it. Yeah, but yes. Yeah, congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> He's a little sick today. But a magazine, Pasadena Magazine, asked me if I wanted to do a column on like late in life motherhood. And then I started writing for this magazine, Business Traveler, because my old editor from Vegas Magazine was there. It was just really fun because to actually get paid as a magazine writer is crazy today and I'm getting paid well. So that's, re- that's really fun. I don't really want to be writing an you know, I started to write a book on motherhood, you know, obnoxiously a week into it. And I, I got like 40,000 words, like almost a full book. And I'm like, I don't know jack shit about motherhood, but most importantly, it's not going to do anything for me. And launching a book is a lot of work. And if it's not going to move the needle for me right now, cause it's not going to, in terms of book sales, I don't make much money from my book sales. There, there's really no point in doing it. So I just sort of tucked it away. What is the, you mentioned about work going into a book. What, give me like the, the one, two, three. So writing it is one thing, obviously, but you've written it. You've written this 40,000 uh, word book, essentially. It's, it's, it's ready or close to ready, I would assume. So assume, assuming the work is done, the writing is done. Tell me about the work. What's the hard part after that specifically? Editing editing is the hard part but then it's just there are so many moving parts like you cannot believe like you're just like what you just lay it out and do a cover oh my god and then there's the keyword optimized book description and then there's getting the amazon page you know with all the keywords and then there's getting all the promotional materials and then there's getting you know podcasts lined up and then there's you know there are so many many things and you can skip a lot of those steps but you may not have the results. I, I want to go in knowing that I'm going to have, no, I did everything and everything's a lot. If somebody's working with you, somebody's working with, uh, with legacy launchpad publishing, what do they, what do they get? What do they expect? What should they expect coming to work with your company? So uh, somebody listening, like I'm thinking about like, if I want to write the book and, and get rid of the advice I, I got, which is, um, only yeah, write it when they're begging it for you, right? When they're begging yeah. it for it. So I come work with Legacy Launchpad. What is it that happens from beginning to end? What what, what What's the process for me? Well, we have two types of clients. We have the ones who have not written anything yet. And then we have the ones who have finished books. Finished is in quotes because a lot of times they've written them themselves or with the help of a sort of substandard editor. And sometimes it's easier to start from scratch than to fix what's broken. Um so that can be challenging because they may be absolutely brilliant. All our clients are, they may even be really natural writers, but if you don't write all day, every day for 10 years, you shouldn't write your own book. 
you just shouldn't. Yeah. Um, so, so usually what happens is we, we do a sort of either I or Caitlin on my team talks to the potential client. If we decide to work together, we, we do a vibe check with a writer. We figure out who on our team is good. They talk. If they vibe, we go to a two page outline where they get interviewed for an hour. They get a two to four page outline. Once they approve that, it moves to like a 20 to 40 page template. And then the book is written from there. And usually it's two hour phone calls once a week. And usually after about in the in the client seeing chapters as they go and approving and then if everything goes as planned we've got a first draft in about three months then it goes to edit a developmental edit then it goes to a copy edit then it goes to a layout at that time where you know they're filling out cover questionnaires and keyword questionnaires we give them about 20 to 40 potential cover designs based on what they like. We pick the cover, we write the keyword optimized bio and book description. <clears throat> and then it 100% depends on like what package they pick, but you can um, then do, you know, so you can do ebook, paperback, hardcover. We can do audiobook. We do, you can record yourself. We can cast an actor or you can even do it with AI, AI um, which is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we do like, we do what we call like um, an authority experience where we're coming up with like the 10 perfect podcasts for you. We're writing the pitch letters. We're figuring out who your competitors are and how you can like stand out from them. We're, we're uh, we have one package where we actually book you on a TV show. So it, there's a lot of things. Is there, is there 100% ownership of the book by the author at that point? Or yeah. is there a split ownership yeah. with your company? Okay. No, we copyright it for the. So why would like Benjamin Hardy, for instance, why would he go, you mentioned him, another guy that's been on the show, right? So why would he go to a traditional publisher who I believe own the rights to the book at that yeah. point? Do they not? Why would he do that? Or why would anyone do that? I should say. I have no some... idea. I thought that was crazy. <laughs> or is it less expensive to go through a traditional publisher? Well, sure, because you're getting paid versus paying. Yeah. I mean, that's that's maybe what his rationale was. But I'll tell you, I read their last book and I saw so many typos in it. And I'm just like, really? This is this is what publishers are doing? Yeah. It's okay to have one typo. J.K. Rowling had typos. Twain had typos. Shakespeare had typos. But I mean, to have them over and over again is pretty egregious. It's funny. I noticed the same. It's funny you say you that. Did? I the same. Well, I got the galley from them and I read that. And then I saw the the final product thinking it's the galley, right? Like all these typos are going to be <laughs> gone, but they weren't. It was really interesting. I had this guy on, I don't know if you know, do you know this guy, Scott Iman? He's an author. No. He's written books on like Hollywood, like John Wayne, biography of John Wayne and Cary Grant. And more recently, he wrote one on Charlie Chaplin. It's called Charlie Chaplin versus America, which I knew nothing about this guy. I know who Charlie Chaplin is, but... The interesting things about Chaplin were one, the whole blacklist McCarthy thing. He was like the, mm. like, what's the word? Enemy number one of, uh, of the FBI back then. They just wanted to deport him. He was originally from England and they were successful in doing that. So that whole dynamic was interesting. But the other part to your point was Chaplin negotiated against the norm back then. Like he could be paid a lot of money to be an actor because he was so famous, but instead he took the money and said, I will pay for all the production because he wanted the ownership rights to his product. And when he died, he was worth like $400 million. So ownership was everything. And I feel like at the core of it, that's what you're delivering on, correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, ownership with, with Party Girl, my first book, I got the rights back from HarperCollins because it had been 10 years because the movie is going to be made and I want to benefit. I don't want Harper to benefit. I love it for whatever it's worth. I have on my, on my goal sheet that I want to have one IMDB credit. So if it gets made and you need like short bald, like Dr. Evil mix with uh, mini me, I'm your guy. I have such a present for you. You can get your <laughs> podcast on IMDB. Did you know? Oh, that? no. Well, I, I didn't know that, but I should. I did. I did modify by saying one major motion picture, but. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. But I, okay. We'll work you, on that. How do you get your podcast on IMDB though? Um, I, it's funny because I, I knew that's how I got on good authority on there. And it's on my list of things to do to get my new one on there. I can't remember. Basically I was Googling somebody and I saw their podcast was on IMDb and I'm like, wait, what? And then I looked into it. You need an IMDb pro account, which is like sure. 10 bucks a month. You do not upload it. I'm telling you, go look into it. I will. Google. I will. Yeah. My check off part of that goal. I love that. Is there a benefit to being on IMDb as a podcaster? It's cool. <laughs> That's the benefit. Got it. I wasn't sure. It was like, oh my God, the reach you get and all of that, but it's just cool. Maybe. I like that.
I like that. All right. So that's on the sell plug. What is the, just, I, and again, I know there's different packages, but like, what should someone expect to invest if they're chosen to write a book with a company like yours? If you're, if you're open to sharing just range of investment. Yeah. The range is our range starts at 22,000 and goes to a hundred. So it's a pretty, wide give me an idea of the two ends of it. A hundred, it sounds like full package. You're getting on oh. TV shows and podcasts and you everything. get a personal assistant. <clears throat> you get, yeah, you get everything. With 22, your book is, com you got to come with a completed book and we're not even editing it. We're putting you through all the, the bells and whistles that we do for our $100,000 clients. But, but uh, it's, it's your material. We're publishing it under our imprint, but we're not like fixing it. Do you have any sense of, and I know this is such a loaded question. I'll let you answer it however you want to, obviously, but like expected return for doing that versus the $2,000 self-publishing route. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, if you're thinking of doing the, like, you know, I love him to death, but like the Dean Jackson, like book in 90 minutes, you're better off not doing a book at all. It, your book is out there for it's your legacy. It's there for the rest of your life. If you think you're worth 90 minutes, like all your experience and, and knowledge is worth that or worth AI writing it. Okay. But, but you know, your book is your representative. So I think make it something you're so proud of. So I, th I think it's like not actually even comparable. It's mm. like apples and oranges. It's like, you know, in, t in terms of expected return, um, if you do a book at the highest level, there's, there's no way to calculate it. You know, I've seen clients, I had a client who had a company that sells to the government and he told me within three months he had negotiated half a million in new contracts. Wow. New clients. Darren, I don't even, I, I don't even know what he's made from it because he's told me that it made his sports agency blow up because he said, you know, conversations with clients, or I mean, with, with agents became conversations between friends because they knew his personal story. So there's really no end to it. It's never going to come through book sales and it's probably not going to come in the year after your book right. comes out, but it's there for the rest of your life. It's the investment you make. You're part of Genius Network. This, you know, we talk a lot about GoBundance on this podcast, the power of masterminds. Obviously, Joe Polish, you know, being the head of Genius Network and having connection to him has been has been amazing. What is it that you derive, the value that you derive from being in a mastermind group like a Genius Network? Can you articulate that? Yeah. And I'm also in Brepic in, in Justin Breen's mastermind. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. You should join. <laughs> I don't know if I'm qualified. Yeah. I'm like a, what am I? I'm an A, B, C, D, E. No. Do you have, what's your quick start? That's the thing that matters. Do you know? No, not offhand. I only know because he makes me talk about it all the time. I'm an eight. He's a 10. So you just get exposure to really brilliant, successful people. I only have a business because of the people I met in Genius Network. I mean, I guess Darren came to me, so that was one. But through Joe, I got my next 10 clients mm. and I continue to get clients from there. But it's not just that. It's what I learned from them. Just being around, you know, whether it's specific business ideas or it's just getting around that attitude of success. I didn't know. I mean, I, I live in Hollywood where everyone is very glamorous and totally broke. I had no idea there was this whole world of people selling like you know, toilet seat covers that were, had massive companies. So I, I got to, uh, to meet people at that level who didn't do anything that I thought successful people did. Mm. So that has been just totally illuminating. Plus they're really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, your story is fascinating. It's interesting. I'm looking at the time we will, we'll wrap it up here, but, but man, I appreciate you, you going through all the machinations, if you will, of, of writing books and all of that. It's been something on my mind for a while. And honestly, I've been stifled by, oh, that's a good point. You know, only write one when they're begging you for it, but you've given another perspective on it. I hadn't thought about. So that's nonsense. <laughs> I love it. Anna, how can people learn more about you, about the company, about what you're doing? Go to legacylaunchpadpub.com. I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram, just at Anna B. David. And that's pretty much it. I love it. I appreciate you doing this. Thanks for spending the time with me today. It's been truly an honor. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun.